everybody for tuning into today's video. Well, now we're into official meteorological uh, autumn, which is from uh, September the 1st to November the 30th, of course. Of course, it's uh, uh, meteorologically questionable, really, because you can get summery weather well on into September, uh, but it, it's uh, useful to deal with the statistics. And statistically, and uh, as far as the Met Office is concerned, we are now into autumn. Uh, so that now that we're into autumn, I just want to do a, a video explaining some of the things that I look at to... Uh, uh, try to bring together a winter uh, long-range forecast uh, some of the things that I uh, personally think are important and useful to look at uh, when trying to uh, ascertain a possible outcome uh, for the uh, coming winter and the things that I'll be looking at uh, through the course of the uh, autumn itself to uh, see what happens now before we get on video just want to talk about the advertising that will usually be a video ad over there my weather videos at gasweatherbits.com do please play those videos because you'll be supporting gasweatherbits.com uh, by doing that so right at the outset the first thing I want to say is uh, long range forecasting is extremely experimental uh, a lot of people don't even believe that it's possible to do it um, it's really just done I just do it really for fun and for enjoyment purposes only but some people uh, own money out of it and a living out of uh, doing long range forecasting they have their own methodologies and uh, ideas about how uh, they go about it but what I do really is just uh, for fun and just for enjoyment purposes only so don't take this too seriously uh, don't take any long range forecast that you see on gasweatherbeats.com uh, too seriously it's uh, extremely experimental and uh, as I say I'm just doing it uh, for fun and enjoyment purposes and maybe uh, helping to uh, uh, move this science on particularly in terms of the models I think the models uh, the long range models are important it's important to uh, use them and to uh, get the long range forecasting uh, uh, companies like uh, Met Office, uh, CFS, uh, NOAA in America, the Chinese Meteorological Agency, uh, the Japanese IOD. It's important to get those uh, companies, those uh, agencies to uh, develop their models and move the science on. So uh, by using their models I hope that over time I'll be helping just a little bit, maybe just a tiny uh, fraction uh, to develop the science to get them to uh, develop the models and uh, really to move things on. So I do that uh, maybe with a little bit more uh, serious intent but really this kind of thing what I'm going to show you today is just for fun and just for enjoyment. So, uh, what I've already done, of course, is the North Atlantic Oscillation Forecast. Now, I did that on the 1st of June. It was based on the sea surface temperature anomalies in the Atlantic during uh, May of uh, the uh, 2012 of this year. So, this is a chart here, a sea surface temperature anomaly chart. Uh, we're looking at here from uh, NOAA, from the United States, from NOAA. Uh, this is one of their sea surface temperature charts for uh, May this year. This is just uh, uh, really to remind you that we've already done I've already done the uh, NAO forecast and that was for a positive NA, uh, NAO of course for the winter because we didn't have uh, the tripod we didn't have the warm cold warm uh, bands through the Atlantic I don't think I need to go over that again the uh, North Atlantic Oscillation video is on my uh, seasonal forecasting page here uh, Gasworth is so if you want to see that again uh, just go to that video and play it and you'll be able to see why I uh, came up with a forecast uh, for a uh, positive NAO for uh, the uh, winter based on May sea surface temperature on this. The other thing we need to look at though in terms of sea surface temperatures uh, is this area here. This is the Enso region stretching from Peru over towards Indonesia. We need to keep an eye on that as we go through uh, the uh, autumn seeing how the Enso is developed. Now I've uh, predicted that we're going to see uh, an El Nino through uh, the latter stages of 2012 and um, that's sort of uh, taking place at the moment. It's a very weak El Nino though it has to be said, uh, very tentative uh, but I still think we are going to see uh, a weak El Nino through the course of uh, the autumn 
and into the winter. Of course, we also need to see how these sea surface temperature anomalies develop uh, through the course of the autumn because it's not guaranteed that we'll see those sea surface temperature anomalies from May uh, resurfacing. They don't always uh, come back in the winter, so we need to see how things develop. Now, this is a very unusual Atlantic sea surface temperature uh, pattern that we've got at the moment. I've uh, not had a look actually to see uh, what the closest year to this is, but this is a very, very unusual uh, sea surface temperature only very intensely warm around Newfoundland and up towards uh, uh, Greenland as well, some really intensely warm along this area. And actually, I don't think this is looking too bad for a negative NAO, really. Uh, it's quite warm through the tropics as well. So I need to have a have a look at that and see how it develops through the autumn, have a look, see uh, what the closest matches uh, to this are. That's a very striking and unusual sea surface temperature anomaly. So that's the uh, sea surface temperature anomaly. It's something else I uh, like to look at is uh, the solar activity, the sunspot activity. Uh, uh, I think that uh, sunspots and solar activity quite important for us. It's perhaps not that important on a global scale, but for us uh, in Europe and in the uh, northwest of Europe, there does seem to be a weak correlation between uh, weak solar activity, weak sunspot uh, minimums, and uh, blocking winter blocking. Um, a lot of our cold winters seem to occur around uh, the time of uh, solar minimum. So yes, I like to look at uh, solar activity to see what's happening now. Uh, we're heading up towards solar maximum. Uh, we're probably going to reach solar maximum sometime uh, through next year, particularly around the middle of next year. Um, but this solar max maximum is going to be very, very much weaker uh, than a lot of the solar maximums that we've seen over the last few years. And actually, for considering we're only a few months away from solar maximum, uh, this is a very, very uh, weak uh, looking pattern across the uh, solar disk that we've got at the moment actually. This is from solarham.net. Keep an eye on this website because you'll be able to see how the uh, solar activity is evolving through the course of the solar maximum. But this really is uh, a uh, very uh, weak sort of uh, solar maximum that we're seeing this time. Um, and whilst we have got some sunspots here, uh, nothing like the uh, sunspot activity, the solar activity that you would expect to see uh, this close to uh, the maximum of the solar cycle. So I'll keep, be keeping an eye on that, seeing how that develops. Will the sun suddenly ramp up? If it does, that might just uh, favour a milder winter with less blocking, uh, perhaps. Something else I like to look at is uh, the uh, Siberian snow cover and how that develops through the course of the, the autumn, I think it's that's one of the more important things to look at, actually, because if uh, so, if a uh, snow cover develops quickly across Siberia and spreads quickly towards Western Russia and Europe, uh, that certainly I think does favour uh, winter cold across Europe because it gets the cold air ingrained uh, quickly it allows that cold air to really pull around western Russia in particular through uh, back in towards Siberia um, so yes I think that's a uh, more important one to look at. This was the methodology uh, that the UCL uh, used to use when they used to come up with their uh, NAO forecast uh, for the winter. Uh, they like to see how that autumn snow cover developed across Siberia and Russia and into uh, Europe as well, Eastern Europe at least. Um, and then they had to base a winter forecast on that snow cover, that snow development uh, that they've released towards the end of November. So that's one of the more important ones to look at. I'll certainly be keeping an eye on this to see how quickly uh, the snow cover develops. We can see that at the moment we have got a few little splodges of snow here across some of the more mountainous areas of uh, eastern Russia. Um, not much showing up at the moment, but this may be actually a little bit above what you would expect to see uh, for the end of August, early September. You perhaps won't uh, normally get these little splodges uh, showing up quite this early, but really there's nothing to see yet, and uh, over the next few weeks this will quickly uh, develop big white areas of snow cover, and they'll uh, with time spread uh, west until the whole of Russia is covered with snow and then the snow will spread in towards East Europe as well but it's how quickly that happens it will happen uh, but it's how quickly that happens that's important uh, for us 
Now, something else that's important uh, is the uh, ice extent in the Arctic. Now, just look at this horrendous uh, melt season, Arctic ice melt season that we've had uh, this year. This really has been an exceptional uh, melt season. Once again, huge amounts of Arctic ice has been lost this summer and around here around Greenland as well and around the Canadian side as well uh, absolutely awful uh, melt season it really is quite sad I think to see uh, the ice thawing out like, uh, like this uh, to this extent I get quite sad about it anyway um, but uh, the uh, Melt season actually uh, favours uh, winter blocking. Uh, there is some evidence that uh, when we get uh, big melt season, these big areas of waters turning up in the middle of the uh, Arctic, there is some evidence that that does favour uh, blocking. Uh, in the winter so this perhaps isn't something to keep an eye on over the autumn the damage is done now uh, the, all this will fill up with ice over the course of the next few weeks but uh, the feedback from this melt season uh, could just favour uh, uh, more uh, winter blocking that could be one of the reasons that we've had a run of cold winters through the last few years actually um, across Europe in particular. It could be uh, a lot to do with the melt seasons that we've been seeing since 2007. But this year's melt season has even beaten uh, 2007. 2007 was uh, termed the death spiral. Well, if that's the death spiral, I hate to think what this year has been because we've beaten 2007. And that's a dreadful, uh, dreadful melt season that we've seen. Now, something else that's important, uh, I think, is the autumn uh, weather patterns. There's a lot of controversy about this to be honest a lot of people believe that uh, autumn doesn't uh, the autumn weather patterns don't at all impact the following season and there's other forecasters and I'm one of them that believes that autumn weather patterns can uh, be important for the winter uh, so this is a uh, one of the ideas is that when you get a warm and dry and anticyclonic September, that can favour um, a milder winter. So this is the sort of pattern uh, that people look for, uh, that believe that September weather patterns are important for the following winter. Uh, this is the uh, kind of pattern that uh, may uh, favour uh, a positive NAO through the winter. Um, so that's uh, uh, the sort of pattern that uh, we're seeing at the moment, really high pressure dominated. Uh, so some forecasters would believe that that perhaps favours uh, high pressure, uh, uh, more of a positive NAO uh, typing, milder type winter. Um, but as I say there's a lot of controversy about this. I'm not particularly uh, keen on the September uh, pattern. This is the uh, opposite of that for September. This is uh, the sort of pattern that uh, forecasters uh, like to see if they want to uh, forecast a colder than average winter uh, they like to see this sort of pattern with low pressure dominating in September and blocking up to the north that's a very unusual uh, pattern though uh, we don't see this in September very often but there is a train of thought that believes that uh, when you get this sort of pattern in September it may favour actually uh, a cold and average winter. Now there's also October's weather patterns I'm uh, more keener on the October weather pattern uh, possibly being uh, important for the uh, following winter. This is the kind of pattern that uh, I believe could uh, favour a milder than average winter and uh, it's blocking up to the north. So this is the opposite of the September idea. Uh, this is uh, suggesting that we get blocking up to the north and low pressure over uh, British Isles and these cold northerly winds. That can then feed in towards a milder uh, than average winter. Uh, outcome or make it uh, more likely that we'll see a milder than average uh, winter outcome and this is the kind of pattern I like to see uh, for a uh, cold winter uh, this sort of pattern that we had in 1995 with high pressure uh, sitting over uh, central Europe pumping up these southerly winds for low pressure up to the northwest uh, this was a very warm dry October and I do like to see a warm and dry October though it's not guaranteed none of these autumn patterns are guaranteed to give us uh, a cold or a mild outcome in the winter uh, it's just uh, slightly favours really uh, the possibility of a certain outcome in the winter but it certainly doesn't guarantee it there are 
always exceptions to any uh, weather uh, normal. Of course, last year we did have a very uh, warm October and a dry October, and that uh, ended up as a mild winter. So uh, there's always exceptions to these things. This is just uh, something that I like to see just to uh, maybe f uh, slightly favour uh, a colder sort of outcome. And then there's other ideas about November. Some forecasters believe that November uh, patterns can be uh, important. And the late great uh, much missed Paul Bartlett, he believed that uh, November was important actually for uh, the uh, forecasting uh, the coming winter. So he his methodology was that if you get a dry September with a lot of anticyclonic influences, uh, that can favour um, a milder winter. Whereas if you have a wet uh, November with low pressure really dominating and giving well above average rainfall that he believed could favour uh, a colder uh, than average sort of outcome. But there's lots of uncertainty about that, uh, about the autumn weather patterns and uh, a lot of forecasts actually believe that uh, they don't favour uh, the winter at all. You can have uh, the weather's random and you can have any kind of pattern in the autumn, any kind of weather in the autumn and the winter will be a completely different season um, and one season doesn't uh, at all impact the following season. There's a lot of forecasters that believe that. I personally, as I say, like to see a drier and warmer than average October just to slightly, very, very slightly uh, uh, favour a colder than average winter. But there's not a lot in it and many of the other things that I looked at first, like the snow cover, uh, like the El Nino region, uh, I think those are a good deal more important really uh, than the autumn weather patterns idea. But certainly the autumn, autumn weather patterns are in there, they'll be in the mix, I'll be keeping an eye on them, uh, seeing uh, what may happen. So I'll be keeping you updated on this course, I'll be doing the model updates anyway, we will be looking at the models uh, three times in September, October and November, uh, the long range models, seeing what they're suggesting, but as well as that, as in addition to that I'm also going to be looking at these other aspects peri periodically through uh, the next few weeks seeing how things are developing and eventually we will come to a uh, decision uh, about what the winter of 2012-2013 uh, may entail. Well that's it for now, hope you've enjoyed the video, it's been a long video so I hope uh, you've stuck with it, hope you've uh, not got too bored by my ramblings, that's it for now, thanks for watching.